We've uh, mentioned this before, I think, over the years, but it's relevant to today's message, so we'll think about it again today. All of us here have been kids at one time, right? Anybody accept? Okay, all right. And we all remember a conversation like this from our past. Daddy, can I jump off the housetop? Or something like that. And Daddy says, no. And we say, yep, why not? And what does Daddy say? Yep, because I said so. Why? Because I'm the daddy and I say so. Now, if you've ever been a kid, then you've had that conversation. And when it was over, and it was over at that point, you may have thought something else. You may not have thought in these words, but this is probably the gist of what you thought. Who gives daddy the authority to make that decision? Why do I have to listen to him? He has the authority to make those decisions because he's the daddy. End of story. He's the dad. He's the authority. No explanation needed. Keep that in mind as we move forward this morning. Listen again to our scripture passage for this morning from the featured book of the Bible for this series on Corinthian questions. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 13 through 20 reads, Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body. Let's do a quick recap of what we're doing here in 1 Corinthians. We're looking at questions from Corinth, or Corinthian questions. The Apostle Paul seems to write the book of 1 Corinthians in response to questions sent to him. There were a lot of problems in the church at Corinth. Some in the church must have asked Paul why they had these problems, and Paul tells them why. Corinth was an immoral town. Corinth was the home of the temple of Diana and temple prostitutes. And Paul has been told that there was immorality within the church. And it was a type of immorality that would make lost people blush. Some in the church were not ashamed about it, but rather puffed up. Paul was disappointed with their actions. And the question here is, What about sexual immorality? And he teaches them and us that sexual immorality is wrong. And he talks about the effects of sexual immorality. And he talks about how to avoid sexual immorality. But before we get to those points, let's start with some foundational knowledge of immorality. A foundation that many do not have today, including some in the church. The lack of this foundation leads to most of the immorality that we see today. So, who determines what is moral and immoral? Think about our earlier thoughts with Daddy. He tells us we cannot do something, and Daddy claims that his position as our father gives him the authority to say so. How can anybody today say definitely that an action is wrong? How can someone say today with authority that premarital sex is wrong? How can someone say today with authority that homosexual sex is wrong? How can I, as a preacher, state so unequivocally that any sex outside of heterosexual marriage is wrong? Isn't that just my own opinion? Isn't that just me trying to apply my idea of morality to others who may not share my ideas? Isn't that just 
my truth? Who determines morality? Because in this day and age, the prevalent opinion is that everyone determines morality for themselves and for themselves only. Even in the church, which is one of the things that we are battling here at the Fount, many in the progressive church today believe that the world sets the morality and the world says that everyone has their own truth. Deeper sources of truth and morality are outdated and no longer authoritative today, they, th they say. But I'm here to tell you today that this notion is nonsense. If morality and truth are purely subjective, that each person determines for themselves what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false, if this idea wins out completely, our world is lost. I'm here to tell you that we have the source for what is true and what is moral. God. It is God who determines morality and truth. God, our creator, has the authority to determine morality. Since he is all-knowing, all-powerful, and the, and the one authority in all matters, he has the authority to determine morality. Because God is perfectly pure. God is all-knowing. God is completely righteous, knowing exactly what is right and wrong. And in his purity and omniscience and righteousness, he has determined what is moral and what is not. And God hasn't kept us in the dark about all of this either. Look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness, of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. We are born with an innate sense of right and wrong. You ever notice that most of the time you just know what is right and what is wrong? Many of our problems stem from the fact that we somehow know what is right and yet we still do wrong. That's because God created us with a sense of right and wrong. And most people, with maybe the exception of psychopaths, have an internal sense of what is right and what is wrong. But God goes even further. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, he writes, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. We don't just have to go by our internal compass of morality. In fact, it's best that we don't, because many people in our culture are losing track of that inner uh, right and wrong. We need to check our internal sense of morality with the Word of God. So we have an internal compass, but we also have, and more importantly, have the external Word of God given to us as our authority. And the Word tells us that sexual immorality is wrong, and it also tells us what sexual immorality is. Immorality affects us. Immorality affects us personally, and we need to understand that salvation means physically for us as well as spiritually. 1 Corinthians 6.15 says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Skipping down to verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Friends, our bodies do not belong to us anymore. Our bodies belong to God. Jesus saved us, body and soul, by his blood on the cross. When we use our bodies for our own selfish desires, we're going against the owner, Jesus. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and God lives within us in a very real way. Immorality is taking the dwelling place of God and exposing it to sin. 
Can you imagine immorality taking place right here in the sanctuary? That's exactly what happens when we commit immorality with our bodies. If you've received Christ as Lord, you are now a part of Christ. And when you engage in immorality, you are taking a part of Christ into the sin. Now, Christ has never sinned and never will, but you are putting his reputation at risk through immorality if you engage in it. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, I don't commit adultery or fornication. I don't visit prostitutes and the like, so I'm good. But did you know that statistics show that up to two-thirds of Christians view pornography regularly or have in the past? And not just view, but actively engage in using pornography to commit sexual immorality. The online porn industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. And it's so easy to find porn that it's even reported that 50% of pastors have been or are addicted to using it for sexual gratification. I confess that I was once addicted to porn, but by the grace of God, I have been set free from that addiction and remain free to this day. But I know that dark and evil draw that porn can have on a man and on some women, too. It is one of the tools of the enemy to try and destroy the witness and testimony of men and women of God. Immorality affects us corporately as well. Individual immorality also affects the church. Here's what was going on at the church in Corinth, looking at 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 7. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not found even among pagans. For a man is living with his father's wife, and you are arrogant, Should you not rather have mourned so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you? For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment. In the name of the Lord Jesus, on the man who has done such a thing, when you are assembled and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved In the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not a good thing. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a a new batch as you really are unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Immorality desensitizes the church to sin. And once the church accepts immorality, it opens the door to all other sins. Once the church decides not to talk about it, the church is giving credibility to it and other sins. Immorality spreads like cancer. When the church refuses to stand up against sin, others will enter into sin. After all, if the church doesn't call sin, sin, anything goes. It can, it can destroy the fellowship. Those who stand up for right will be in conflict with those who are accepting of immorality. This conflict will destroy the fellowship, and it is tearing our denomination and others apart. So what should we do about sexual immorality? Flee from it. 1 Corinthians six eighteen in the NIV says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Don't stand around it. Don't observe it from afar. Don't flirt with it. Flee. Run. Immediately away. What about those who are sexually immoral outside the church? Well, stand on the principles of God's word. Win them to Jesus Christ. Tell them that God will forgive them if they repent. And tell them that Jesus can give them a new start. Next week, we'll talk about what about the Lord's Supper. I invite you to read 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 30. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 30. 
uh, to prepare for next week. Let's pause now for a few moments of prayerful reflection as we consider what God may be saying to us.